There's nothing that the brain cannot do. It will solve all problems of Earth and life. Having completed that, it will move on to the hypothetical. Theoretical situations that may or may not occur. Aristotle once said that the brain tempers the heat and seething of the heart. But is that really the case? Does thinking deeply about some person or idea really placate the often volatile nature of emotion? Consider, for example, a child who wants a specific toy for Christmas. The child may think very frequently about that toy, yet the more he or she thinks about it, the more devastating it so often is when Christmas morning comes and no such toy is present under the tree. Oh, I got dozens of presents. Oh, I got everything. Except mystery date. A student who fixates on studying for a major exam may often perform more competently than one who is less concerned, yet it is also common for students to so overthink things as to harm his or her own performance, having built the test up in the mind as something terrifying and insurmountable. There are countless examples from everyday life that seemingly contradict the hypothesis of Aristotle, that sometimes excesses of mere thought can make us far more irrational than we may be were we to think about subjects just a little bit less. Is a lack of thought, perhaps sometimes, better at tempering the heart than an excess of it? Is it possible to persuade the self into irrational beliefs or even violent action based on nothing more than mere thought? In late March of 2023, six people, including three children, lost their lives at the Presbyterian Covenant School in Nashville, Tennessee, in a tragic, violent act that local police chief John Drake described as likely a product of resentment as the shooter had previously attended the school. There's some belief that there was some resentment for having to go to that school. I uh, don't have all the details of that just yet. And, uh, and that's why this incident occurred. While as of the time of writing and recording, the exact motives of the perpetrator are unknown, social media was immediately set ablaze with speculation and perhaps more disturbingly, both excuses and justifications, as well as generalizations and demonization. The perpetrator, who identified as a transgender female to male, was seemingly defended for their actions on websites like Reddit and Twitter, with the likes of David Pakman even implying that the victims deserved it for not praying hard enough. The event occurred just days before the Trans Day of Visibility, and a then-proposed Trans Day of Vengeance protest which was subsequently cancelled, and came on the heels of the Let Women Speak event attended by feminist Posey Parker, who was doused with tomato juice, spat upon, and claimed she was physically beaten by transgender activists in New Zealand. Not even two weeks after the events that occurred in Nashville, a 19-year-old transgender male to female, surnamed Whitworth, was arrested following a 911 call from a sibling, alerting the police of a plot to commit and perhaps a at several local schools the suspect had also attended as a child. As with the Nashville killer, the police did find a manifesto, but as of yet, it has not been released. And when questioned by the police as to a motive, Whitworth responded, quote, no specific reason. In early April, college swimming champion Riley Gaines was physically assaulted and forced to barricade herself from a mob of trans activists for three hours on the San Francisco University campus during a speech she was giving describing her experiences competing with transgender athlete Leah Thomas the previous year. Gaines has also reported that the mob held her for ransom, but what is confirmed is that the school's vice president for student affairs and enrollment, Jamila Moore, later sent an email to students thanking them for their behavior. This extremity of thought can cut both ways in terms of the potential for violence. In early May, a man surnamed Garcia took the lives of eight people at a mall in Allen, Texas. Unlike the Nashville shooter or Whitworth, his alleged social media posts, and I should emphasize alleged, largely left on the obscure Russian outlet Odnoklasniki, or Classmates, were almost immediately uncovered by Bellingcat journalist Eric Toller and were published by news outlets, including photos of a faceless person sporting seemingly fresh Schutzstaffel and swastika tattoos, posts with disparaging remarks about a Jewish teacher, but also posts saying that he was inspired by libs of TikTok, screenshots of Tim Pool's podcast, a handwritten letter saying he doesn't like white people or non-Mexican Hispanic people, and a post praising the Nashville shooter specifically, describing it as the greatest accomplishment of feminism, all of which received little to no interaction, just his mere, vile and bizarre thoughts 
increasing in their extremity all alone in the void of Russian social media. The media has been awash for years now with coverage of trans issues, with conservative pundits expressing concern over children transitioning and the content of books in public school libraries, while left-wing pundits describe these concerns as bigoted and even the precursors to genocide, if not genocide in and of itself. Yeah, no, you just support the genocide of trans kids and you want every, everyone who supported them. Yeah, no, that you do. That is such an assumption. It's such an assumption, right, with all of this Right. What is anti-trans on the table? <laughs> Your TPS, TPUSA, you dumb Whatever. <laughs> My camera. When the political temperature is so radioactive, can merely thinking about such a heated subject, particularly one that involves individual identity and sense of self, actually produce ideological extremity and even violent action? But more generally, can the media create a perception of the importance and severity of some social issue, and that perceived importance produce rumination, obsession, and fanaticism that ultimately leads to not just anger and hatred, but even violence? Today, let's examine the research on the power of self-persuasion and mere thought, and how we can seemingly gaslight ourselves into false but nonetheless dogmatic beliefs. So, can we gaslight ourselves into believing that extreme action is the only logical option? Not so much through logical reasoning, but emotional processing. While some beliefs end up being so extreme, perhaps based on obsessive rumination, that they can bring everyone together, such as this tweet from Bill Kristol who claimed that the Chinese spy balloon identified over the United States in early 2023, had it been plastered with conservative slogans that Republicans then subsequently would have worshipped the balloon, a tweet seen as such a bad take that it produced a rare instance of bipartisan mockery. As said though, such a reaction is rare. Why would conservatives worship a Chinese spy balloon, Bill? We're not all Mitch McConnell. Most of us can even use the stairs. Well, maybe not me, but most of us. Julian! Back to the point. When Anna Kasparian tweeted that she was a woman rather than a person with a uterus or a menstruating person or a birthing person, she was admonished by many left-wing commentators. A backlash against them, and for good reason, because they would double down. They would get the retweets from Ben Shapiro. Matt Walsh would quote tweet them positively. And yeah, so like all the stuff, it's like, it, all the worst we're trying to help you. Yeah, we're trying to like correct you, not aggressively. This is an argument that your stupid argument is giving them ammunition. That's not a guilt by association. That's saying you are being dumb in public, you're not thinking about it, and you're helping them sell their narrative. That's not guilt by association. The bigger context was the reply. Um, it got very combative and a lot of Nazis popping in, agreeing with her, Ben Shapiro's retweeting her, Carrie Lake popping in saying, hey, a broken clock. While receiving kudos from more right-wing ones, which seemed to deeply frustrate her, Perhaps overthinking these issues has produced such deep partisanship that Bill Kristol really does truly believe that Republicans would worship a Chinese spy balloon, while Anna Kasparian's coverage of her disgust for conservatives every day for nearly a decade has also made her incapable of recognizing a rare moment of agreement, let alone that her choice of hairstyle makes her look a bit like a Cenobite. I can't say for sure. However, I think we can understand how people are able to argue themselves into such bizarre attitudes by looking to research on self-generated attitude change. Some of the earliest research on self-generated attitude change from Sadler and Tesler 1973 illustrated how mere thoughts can quickly turn emotional. In this experiment, male university students were seated in a cubicle supposedly next to another student participant and asked to share some information about himself with his partner. In reality, the other participant was a pre-recorded tape of a graduate student. In one condition, the recorded voice complimented the subject while describing themselves in a positive but not braggadocious light. In the other condition, the voice denigrated the subject while describing themselves in a smug and arrogant light, saying, for example, quote, I mean, you might not know about how girls are here and stuff like that, but believe me, I do. How is prostitution illegal, but alimony isn't? They're basically the same thing. You're paying for the whore to leave. Some subjects were then given a distracting and irrelevant task to complete, while others were instructed to think about their partner for intervals of 10 seconds, one minute, and four minutes, 
after which time participants were asked how much he liked his partner and would want to work with that partner on another experiment in the future. In general, subjects were less favorable towards the supposed partner when he had been rude, but attitudes were considerably more negative when respondents were asked to think about the interaction rather than when they were given a distraction task. Thus, it seemed that even early social science experimentation didn't evidence Aristotle's hypothesis. That is, thinking about someone more doesn't increase rationality, generating reasons for why the partner might have reacted the way that he did, that perhaps he had just had a bad day or was an unskilled interlocutor. Oh my Big God. words, you know? That is big and words. And I no, instead, it produced more raw, negative attitudes towards him the more that participants just thought about him, a total anonymous stranger. The effects of self-persuasion can be extended from an individual toward a group, using the same function of self-generated attitude change, and specifically, construal theory. Construal theory posits that attitudes change when the attributes associated with some construct change. As such, one method of changing attitudes comes in the form of changing perceptions of what something or someone is. This is not always done intentionally, for as we've already seen, ruminating on our thoughts about a certain person or thing can produce very different attitudes despite a lack of new information. For example, let's say that Bob has an interaction with John, who is a member of a fringe political group, the, I don't know, Johnstonians. Bob finds John's behavior to be argumentative and blunt, giving him a negative impression of John and by extension, John's social group, causing him to moderately oppose their movement. Bob later goes on social media to dissuade others from becoming involved with the Johnstonians and tells others that they are argumentative, blunt, arrogant, and do not value human life. Hang on a second, did you see what happened there? Bob has created new data that allowed his opinion towards this group to move from the benign to the more extreme through a process of mere thought, self-persuasion, and self-generated memories. In some additional early research on how perceptions towards a group can be generated or altered by mere thought, Sadler and Tesler 1977 provided subjects with a positive and negative description of members of various groups and asked for their opinion on said group members. Then some worked on an unrelated anagram task, while others were given no such task and both were asked to think about the group that they had read about before, again providing their attitudes towards them. Oh my god. Ginger? Oh! <clears throat> Sadler and Tesser found that subjects who thought about a person described negatively liked that person less than did subjects who were distracted from thinking using an anagram task. In opposition, subjects who were given an opportunity to think about a likable partner liked him more than did subjects who were distracted. The same pattern emerged in a study from Tesser and Conley, 1975, who assessed polarization of attitudes towards various social issues based again on nothing more than mere thought. Across three experiments, they found that when participants were asked to focus on their opinions towards a topic rather than being distracted, their agreement or disagreement towards that topic became polarized. That is, participants who agreed with the statement that, for example, prostitution should be legal, or that revolution is the best way to solve political problems, just roll the credits. Immediately after being exposed to the question, only more strongly agreed with their own position the more time that he or she spent thinking about the question without distraction. Thus, just ruminating on an existing political opinion can strengthen those existing beliefs, rather than producing more nuanced ones. No! <laughs> Go! Six million! It was 250,000! Maybe eight million! Keep going. As we'll see more going forward, it's a phenomenon that has wide-reaching implications all the way up to geopolitics and the global divisions currently touching our lives, like the invasion of Ukraine, which not only caused a lot of doubling down on pre-existing beliefs, it caused the prices of essentials to go up for everyone, regardless of our humanitarian leanings. Even if you can put some money away, inflation is eating into it as we speak. It's hard to get by and even harder to get ahead. But there are some ways to try and get back what you should have had, and one market still had a record-breaking year even in 2022, an asset that you can now access in minutes without needing millions of dollars, thanks to Masterworks art investing platform. Masterworks has sold over $45 million in art with the proceeds going to their investors. And that's not a one-off. Every Masterworks exit to date has returned a profit. In fact, they've sold another two offerings in just the last few weeks, even as economic turmoil continues. With over 700,000 users, Masterworks offerings have sold out in minutes, they even had to make a waitlist for new users, 
but I got special access to skip it. Just click the link in the description right down below and check it out for yourself. Thanks so much to Masterworks for sponsoring this video. And now that we have something useful to consider for our own futures, let's get back into the research on the power of mere thought. Because repeatedly thinking about an individual with negative associations seems to extend into negative beliefs about a group that that person is a part of, how can individual people, serving as exemplars of some group, alter opinions towards entire classes of people, including politicized classes of people, over time? Sia et al. 1997 examined the control theory across three experiments. In their first study, half of their sample of college student participants were first asked to rate their attitudes towards a category of people politicians, homosexuals, televangelists, talk show hosts, foreign leaders, rock musicians, and comedians, as well as their attitude towards vegetables, serving as a control. What qualifies you to be a U.S. Senator? You have 60 seconds. Hi, good night, everybody. The other half of students were instead asked to name a specific person who fell into each one of these categories, and then list as many other people from that category that they could think of before then providing their attitudes towards the groups and vice versa for those who began by stating their attitudes towards the group, then going on to list specific exemplars. Two weeks later, this same sample of participants were asked to complete an unrelated study examining how familiarity influenced liking of people and objects and were given a list of 150 well-known items. For example, Rice Krispies, sports cars, and Bill Clinton, and included the specific exemplars that they themselves had provided in the first experiment. Participants then reported on how much they liked each of the items. No, I don't want that. After an additional two weeks, subjects returned to the lab and completed the same procedure as in the first session. Subjects were the most likely to recall the same politician twice, followed by the same homosexual person, same televangelist, same talk show host, and finally, same foreign leader. All more politicized categories of people compared to musicians or comedians, or at least that would have been the case in the 90s when being openly gay was far more controversial. You are gay, and all gays are pedophiles. That's nonsense. So you freely admit that you are the possessor of nonsense. Attitudes towards these groups were more stable when the participant gave the same answer at both times of assessment, and attitude stability was also more potent in a somewhat similar pattern as exemplar stability. That is, attitudes towards politicians were the most stable, followed by televangelists, then talk show hosts, then foreign leaders, and finally, homosexuals. If you named the same person twice as a representative of a group, your attitude towards that group then tends to be more solidified. These results indicate that people who have a less precise idea of a specific person who represents a group tend to have less stable attitudes towards that group. However, there were some significant differences. Namely, in that while politicians were very stable, both in terms of naming the same one and in terms of attitude, in turn, while people tended to name the same homosexual figure most commonly, second only to politicians, attitudes towards homosexuals as a group were far less consistent. And again, do keep in mind that this study was published in 1997, so the topic of gay marriage or even just not being closeted was seen as more socially contentious. However, it may be apt were this study to be reconducted today to replace homosexual people with transgender people. Certainly not an actual thing that's happening or anything. And your preferences are not biologically ingrained. It's not just, sorry, I don't like penises. It's, sorry that I have been conditioned by society to view penises as a male sexual organ and I cannot fathom the fact that a trans woman's body is her own and that whatever parts a trans woman has are women's parts. But I would suggest such a change in the analysis to kind of reframe these findings under a more modern lens. Because I think you might find something very similar today for trans people as they found for homosexual people in the 90s. But let me explain. If I ask a person at random to think of a transgender person, well, they might think of someone like Dylan Mulvaney and report a very negative opinion towards transgender people as a group when using Dylan as an exemplar. Dylan's a winner! Dylan's a winner! Dylan, nice job, man. Look at that. Uh, we're gonna spin the wheel right after this. Don't go away, folks. However, if I ask that same person to think of a trans individual a month from now, that very same person, who was not so fond of Dylan, might then think of Blair White and report more favorably on their opinions towards transgender people as a whole, based on which exemplar most readily comes to mind. Whew, people are gonna be mad about this one. 
Because of the uniqueness of politicians and homosexuals as groups in the first experiment, Sia et al.'s second study looked at these groups and related groups, as well as behaviors more specifically. As before, participants were asked to list an exemplar individual from a variety of groups, including politicians, televangelists, homosexuals, talk show hosts, foreign leaders, business leaders, and people with AIDS. Nice of them to add two groups that Anthony Fauci would sure like to make disappear. Little boy, are you sure you haven't taken it up the hoo-hoo just once or twice? Two weeks later, the same subjects reported on their attitudes towards a wide variety of people and things, including the examples they had previously identified. Finally, a month after the initial assessment, participants were again asked to name an exemplar from each group and rate how much they liked that group. After completing the questionnaire, the experiment was interrupted by a confederate, meaning a graduate student actor in on the experiment, not, you know, the other kind. Advance the flag of Dixie, hurrah, hurrah. Who urgently needed help disseminating some petitions from the student council and polling the opinions of the student body. At this point, the researchers allowed the Confederate to take over the session and left the room, only a hundred and some odd years too late. I mean, you know, at least for some. The three petitions concerned requesting the university invite more speakers to campus, either politicians, homosexuals, or environmentalists. What's the difference? Respondents were free to sign all, some, or none of the petitions. Afterwards, the Confederate asked how willing participants would be to engage in a variety of 24 different activities to help bring these speakers to campus. The South will rise again, man! Such as signing more petitions, giving speeches, participating in group activities, writing letters, making phone calls, and getting others to participate in activities. Students were asked to answer honestly, as the student council may call upon them to engage in these behaviors in the future. After completing the petition questionnaires, the Confederate left and the original study continued, with participants being asked to rate the likability of the exemplar that he or she had given in both times of assessment. Finally, as with all social science research, subjects were debriefed after completing the last leg of the experiment. And interestingly, many expressed surprise that they would not be required to assist in the activities that they believed they had signed up for, while others seemed to continue to erroneously believe that the session had in fact really been interrupted by the student council, despite being told it was a farce. The South shall come again! As before, attitude stability was significantly greater for students who named the same rather than a different exemplar for politicians, homosexuals, televangelists, and foreign leaders, while being only marginally significant for business leaders and people with AIDS. Although attitudes were largely consistent when the exemplar was consistent, there was no significant difference in attitude extremity between those who named a different exemplar between two assessments and those who named the same exemplar. Nor was there any difference between the popularity of the named exemplar between those who changed and those who remained consistent. Meaning that if someone really likes or really hates a certain group, they tend to have strong feelings towards all members of that group. In terms of intentions to engage in behaviors that would assist in the fight for or against a member of the liked or disliked group from speaking on campus, the results were indicative that either changing to a different but equally likable exemplar or changing one's liking of the same exemplar both reduced behavioral consistency, meaning that those who like a group in general but did not identify a single person as a consistent exemplar of that group tend to perhaps be a bit less willing to fight for them to speak on campus. Thus, someone who has a consistent positive attitude towards homosexuals as a group, for example, who consistently names a singular person as a positive exemplar of that group, say, Elton John, will be far more willing to campaign for him to perform on their college campus. Students who named the same politician both times displayed greater attitude behavioral consistency than did those who named a different politician both as it applied to behaviors towards the student council and signing the petition itself. Further, students who did not change in reported likability of their exemplar were somewhat higher in attitude behavioral consistency than those whose likability changed over time. Similar results as those reported for politicians were also reported concerning homosexual speakers on campus. Changing exemplars significantly predicted whether a student would behave either more or less positively towards politicians or homosexuals in terms of actual behavior than his or her initial attitude would have suggested, indicating that positive or negative attitudes towards a group extends quite far into intentions to actually act upon those feelings in the form of activism. A third study examined specifically how merely thinking about an exemplar of a group may influence attitudes towards that group, 
bringing us back to the specific role of mere thought on attitude extremity. As before, a first round of questioning asks subjects to name an exemplar from 27 different groups as well as their attitudes towards those categories of people. Two weeks later, the same participants were asked to rate how much they liked a wide variety of figures, including the politician they had chosen before as an exemplar. Finally, two weeks after that, respondents were asked to estimate the height of 10 famous people, with the 10th person either being their exemplar politician or another politician, drawn from the second round of surveying. This politician was either one that the participant reported that he or she liked or that he or she disliked, and subjects completed another round of rating the likability of all of the figures. While attitudes towards the exemplar remained completely stable before and after being asked to determine their height, which served as a thought-provoking reminder of that politician, attitudes changed significantly after ruminating on the more and less liked but non-exemplar politicians. Being reminded of the more liked politician significantly increased positive ratings of that person, flipping a mildly negative perception into a positive one. Similarly, participants who were reminded of a disliked politician more than doubled in the negativity of their attitude rating towards that politician. Thus, people tend to use exemplars to help define their attitudes towards a wider group of people to which that exemplar belongs, and the more they ruminate on their feelings towards that exemplar, the more negative or positive their existing opinions towards that group that the person represents tend to turn. Hence, if someone thinks of, say, Matt Walsh as being a representative of the broad group of conservatives, and they dislike Matt Walsh, just thinking about him more will exacerbate those negative associations with conservatives as a group. Because merely thinking about a person who represents a group or an idea can have such seemingly powerful effects on political opinions towards that group, it shouldn't be surprising that existing opinions on a subject, when we see that subject as important, can result in attitude extremity, as seen in a series of experiments from Liu and Latane, 1998. Look, also, I'm starting with early, more seminal studies here. We'll get into the more modern research very soon, but just bear with me for the time being. In their study, conducted in the fall of 1992 and spring of 1993, college students were asked about their political identity as liberal, moderate, or conservative, and as Democrat, Republican, or Independent, as well as how involved, committed, and knowledgeable they were with politics, and then were asked about how important a series of 14 political issues were for him or her, including environmental protection regulations, women's rights, nationalized healthcare, social equality, and abortion. Democrates, baby killers. The more important that students reported an issue as being, the more extreme their attitude was towards that position, and the most important issues for college students were consistently liberal issues. Despite the fact that subject importance correlated consistently with attitude extremity, extremity of belief was not related to actual political involvement, and in fact, many of the relationships between individual attitudes and involvement were negative. That is, these college students had very strong opinions, but weren't willing to do much about them besides complain. You want to stick your watches, bollocks, bro. Both self-identified Democrats and Republicans reported feeling similar levels of being liberal or conservative, respectively, being politically involved, and attitude extremity. While independents were, unsurprisingly, less partisan, politically motivated, but not less extreme in their attitudes towards different political topics. The scholars also found that higher-level self-categorizations of political ideology, such as describing the self as being a Marxist or a free-market capitalist, rather than simply as a conservative or a liberal, actually had no influence on attitude extremity, and that attitude extremity for specific issues were largely uncorrelated to one another. That is, people with more nuanced or complex political ideologies are no more likely to highly value a specific political issue, and thereby hold more extreme opinions towards that issue than those with less nuanced political identities. Further, it seemed that people tended to have pet issues rather than ideologically consistent concerns for all subjects equally. While the scholars hypothesized that the importance and extremity of issues should load onto two factors, valuing equality or valuing individual freedom, they only found support for one of those factors on influencing attitude extremity, valuing equality, which explained 26% of variance on attitude extremity and its associated subjects, such as women's rights and social welfare, compared to individual freedom, which explained only 6% in its associated subjects, such as environmental protection regulations and the death penalty. Thus, the topics that seem to be most ideologically driven by the potential for self-persuasion are equality-based and tend to be more left-wing topics, 
And this is the case regardless of the complexity of one's political identity or actual political action. It seems that just thinking a topic is important in society produces extreme attitudes towards that topic as a product of mere thought. And it is often people who probably don't know too much about politics, nor are particularly involved in them, who are so heavily influenced by partisan shifts in attitude extremity based on little more than thinking that the issue is important. And further, this seems to largely apply only to left-wing issues. We can easily see then how people can convince themselves that some political problem is in need of extreme response just because they think more about it as a form of self-persuasion into political extremity. Where this becomes particularly concerning is how these findings interact with agenda-setting theory, which was identified by McCombs and Shaw in 1972, who found an astonishing correlation of 0.98 between what topics were covered by the media and what topics people believed were important and which subsequent analysis has continued to find pretty persistently, despite the massive expansion of the media landscape. If the media is constantly reporting on how, for example, January 6 is worse than 9-11, well, then people will think that January 6 is a very important issue, and just by virtue of thinking that it's important, their attitudes toward it will move in an extreme partisan direction via nothing more than mere thought. Similarly, if one is led to believe that transgender people are the victims of a genocide, because that's the framing being used by the media in its constant coverage of trans issues, their beliefs about that topic will become more extreme and then, well, sometimes, extreme beliefs can lead to extreme actions. For decades, there has been a massive debate in communication scholarship about the potentiality for the media to infect and inject people with beliefs and opinions a theory known as the hypodermic needle effect that's been largely abandoned, given that it has received little to no empirical support. In contrast, one of the most common frameworks for understanding how media agenda setting influences people is cultivation theory, which was proposed by Gerbner in 1969, who hypothesized that those who spend more time watching television would come to perceive the world in a way that aligns with media messaging. One aspect of cultivation theory that has received significant support is the mean world hypothesis, which evidences that people who watch a lot of news programs, given that the news tends to be preoccupied with stories of crime and danger, come to believe that the world is a more dangerous place than it actually is. However, outside of the mean world effect, for every article you come across using cultivation theory as a framework, you're likely to find another criticizing its use. It's for this reason that it is one of the most common topics of media psychology research. I would hypothesize that a far better answer to the question of the persuasive power of agenda setting instead lies in control theory and self-persuasion via the effect of mere thought. The media does not inject us with beliefs. We must convince ourselves. And to see how that works, we should look into the power of mere thought. Given that just thinking about a subject can produce polarization unintentionally, self-persuasion, of course, can also increase belief extremity, as classic social science research has illustrated. With, for example, subjects coming to hold more negative attitudes towards smoking after being asked to role-play a scenario wherein he or she was tasked with convincing a friend to quit, compared to when they simply read information about the health risks of smoking. That is, when people seek to persuade others, they often first and foremost persuade themselves. Brinnell, McCasson, and Patty 2012 examined the power of self-persuasion across a series of studies concerning the issue of cost of university tuition. In their first experiment, subjects were told the institution was considering either raising or lowering the tuition cost, and were then tasked with coming up with arguments to defend the proposal to convince either themselves or to convince others. Participants rated the pro-attitudinal position, that of tuition decrease, which, at least on its face, is going to be the preferred option for the vast majority of college students, that is, well, obviously students want the tuition lowered, not raised, anyway, they rated that otherwise student-oriented position less favorably when the target of the persuasive arguments was other students rather than themselves. But curiously, those asked to defend the counter-attitudinal position, that of a tuition hike, were more favorable towards the proposal when asked to create arguments to convince themselves rather than other students. In a second study, subjects were asked to rate how much effort they put into developing these persuasive messages and reported that they exerted more effort when promoting a decrease in tuition for others than for themselves, but also more effort when promoting a tuition raise to themselves compared to others. 
working harder when trying to convince themselves that there must be some merit in a position that they almost assuredly did not initially align with. It seems that while it's a bit more work to convince the self into a position that is not in one's self-interest, the arguments created by this effect are more able to change one's mind than arguments that originate from others, basically a form of internalized intellectual self-flagellation. In a third study, subjects were told that the other student they were to persuade either already agreed with the proposal or disagreed with it, and found that participants rated the tuition decrease argument as less self-persuasive when they were instructed to persuade others rather than to persuade themselves, and the opposite was the case for the tuition increase argument, which was more self-persuasive when the other student disagreed. These results could indicate that people are more able to convince themselves of the validity of something they don't personally believe in when others are oppositional to them becoming more self-persuaded when the opposition is not accepted by others and making the self the underdog in the argument. If a group of people think that they are being oppressed, even genocided then, it's easier for those people to persuade themselves into beliefs and maybe even behaviors they might otherwise find irrational or even against their own best interests. In a fourth and final study, participants were asked to develop as many arguments as they desired either in support of or in opposition to a new mandatory comprehensive exam required for graduation, either to persuade themselves or to persuade other students. Again, something the vast majority of students are not going to be naturally very keen toward. They found that students were more in favor of implementing the exam when trying to persuade themselves and generated significantly more arguments than when attempting to persuade others. Thus, we may be more persuaded by our own internal arguments, even for positions that we don't actually hold, and would otherwise be staunchly opposed to, allowing us to convince ourselves of things that are against our own best interests. More so than attempts at persuading others, he is capable of moving our own opinions on a topic. You are your own best propagandist. Perhaps then the most persuasive arguments don't come from the media or from politicians, but from people arguing with themselves. Five of the hardest words in the English language are, after all, is this what I believe? We so very often don't want to ask it, because the answer could be no. Not only can we persuade ourselves even into an idea that is harmful to us, we can actually alter our own perceptions of our memories through rumination to self-persuade, as seen in a study of self-generated memory from Tversky and Marsh 2000. In their first experiment, participants were asked to read a story about spending a week with their two new college roommates, who engaged in typical collegiate behaviors such as going to the library or going to a party. For three scenes, each roommate did two social, one neutral, and one annoying activity. For the other three scenes, each roommate did two annoying, one social, and one neutral activity. After reading the story, subjects were asked to either write a letter of recommendation for one of the roommates, for a fraternity or sorority that emphasized partying and sociality, a letter of complaint to the Office of Student Housing asking to no longer live with one of the roommates due to negative behaviors, or simply recall as much information about one of the roommates, positive or negative, as possible. After a 20-minute delay, participants were asked to rate the roommates on their perceived optimism, leadership, sociability, athletic ability, messiness, and inconsideration, and then to retell the original story as accurately as possible. I'm animated. I'm alive. My heart's big. It's got hot blood going through it fast. I like to fight, too. I like to eat. I like to have children. Hi. They found that participants asked to write the pro-social letter of recommendation recalled more social aspects of their roommate, including information about athleticism and sociability, rather than annoying or neutral aspects. In contrast, those asked to write a letter of complaint recalled far more annoying aspects than neutral or social ones. Charlie, I do backflips every single day of my life. No, you don't! I have never seen you do a backflip right now, please! Can I see one? Let's see one! I need to stay focused and conserve energy, and that's, you know, come on. Those asked to simply remember as many aspects as possible recalled far more than the directed conditions, but also recalled slightly more annoying aspects than they did positive ones. When asked to retell the entire story 20 minutes later, those who were not directed to do anything more than remember as much as possible recalled very few details, while those who wrote the social letter mostly only remembered social aspects and those who wrote the complaints mostly only remembered annoying aspects of the roommate. 
Subjects also remembered more relevant information about the roommate that they wrote about than they did about the roommate described in the story who was not the focus of the writing task. As such, when people have specifically been primed to recall negative or positive information about a person, their long-term memories are altered to reflect that perspective, meaning that when only certain information is made salient, perspectives on a person or event can change the very memories that we hold towards that subject matter. When all of the media reports about Trump, for example, is overwhelmingly negative, well then the things that people are going to remember about Trump are also going to be negative. A second experiment largely replicated the findings of the first. In a third study, subjects read a true crime story that included either incriminating, exonerating, or ambiguous information about the case and two possible suspects involved. Well, what do we do? Why don't we just wait here for a little while? And were then either asked to write a summary for the jury explaining why one of the characters in the story was guilty, or to simply recall any and all information from the police report included in the initial story. After a 20-minute delay, all participants were asked to recall as much as they could about the case in general and answered a series of questions about the incriminating clues, the exonerating clues, and the neutral or ambiguous clues present in the story. In general, there was a clear bias towards the incriminating rather than exonerating clues, with both those asked to describe one character's guilt and those who were simply asked to recall general information both being far more likely to recall incriminating elements rather than exonerating ones, to about the same degree. However, those not directed to explain the guilt of one party remembered more neutral details than did those who wrote the incriminating summary. While both those who wrote the jury summary and those who simply recalled the police report also made more incriminating elaborations, creating new details not present in the text itself, those who wrote the jury summary included nearly three times as many elaborations than those who were not given a biased recall prompt. That is, those asked to think about a character's guilt completely fabricated three times as many facts about the case than those merely asked to think about the case in general. These weren't real facts or memories. They were completely invented. They were fiction. It's fiction. We made it up. Those in the biased summary condition recalled more incriminating information about the suspect discussed in the story than a side character and recalled more exonerating information about the non-discussed character than the accused. While interestingly, those asked to remember non-specific details recalled more incriminating information about the non-discussed character than the discussed one, and equal amounts of exonerating information for both. Perhaps because, not being directed, they were looking for more clues and attempting to find the real culprit. Thus, even in the case of something as serious as a murder trial, people's memories are easily influenced by their own minds and attention span. So much so that people will unintentionally fabricate incriminating evidence simply just because they have been instructed to provide incriminating evidence to a jury. This is perhaps also why to this day, and I mean to this day, whenever you, dear viewer, are watching this, there are people who absolutely still believe that Kyle Rittenhouse killed three African Americans in cold blood with a gun that he carried across state lines illegally. And he was approached by a group of individuals who posed an imminent threat to his life. He drove across state lines in a state that he doesn't even live in, and then he crossed state lines with it. In their fourth and final experiment, Tversky and Marsh returned to the roommate dilemma, and once again tasked respondents with reading a story about their two imaginary roommates. And afterwards, subjects were asked to write a report to the university explaining why they no longer wished to live with one of the roommates, Lisa. But this time we're told to not include any story elements, but instead to simply explain their feelings. Afterwards, subjects were asked to identify Lisa's five most prominent traits and rate how strong these traits were. Participants included four times as many negative elaborations recalling elements not present in the story itself than they did negative story items or generalizations, which were elements present in the story but not recalled entirely accurately in the retelling. Almost no positive elements were recalled at all. Traits used to describe Lisa were overwhelmingly negative and participants remembered more annoying aspects of her character than the other non-discussed roommate. These results are indicative then that when we have been told we have a good reason to not like another person and are then asked to explain why we don't like that person, we may tend to report the person as being more annoying but perhaps of more concern. We may create false memories of things that that person has done to earn our dislike. Essentially, if we have been told that someone is an annoying or bad person, 
The story alone goes beyond making us dislike them for those very specific reasons, and instead we can invent new reasons to dislike the person completely outside of the facts we have at hand. We can gaslight ourselves into disliking or perhaps even hating others. Then Kane hits Abel over the head with a rock. Yeah, that guy. And then meets Lilith. And that happens. Yeah, go fuck well. And then too. God says, I'm going to curse you to have to eat your children. Yeah, well, you know. So much of modern political discourse is based on seemingly little more than being told that a group is bad and that we should dislike them. And then, via mere thought and rumination, self persuasion, and self generated memories, we can not only convince ourselves that said group is bad, but actually create new reasons to dislike them. And that all becomes integrated into our memories to the point where we can't always tell, or at least easily recall, what a group has actually done to warrant such disdain. Versus the fictive version of their behavior that we've created for ourselves in our own minds. Is political animus starting to make a little bit more sense now? That's why I'll never forgive the Japanese! Then again, they make some rather nifty gadgets. Much of the recent research concerning the power of mere thought on self-persuasion, and specifically polarization, has been conducted by Dr. Kaylee Decker, including her doctoral thesis completed in 2022, which we can examine to better understand the power of mere thought on perceptions of groups of people. In her first experiment, university students were told that there were two regions that were appealing to the United States government to recognize their own government as a nation, the Barum region of Yemen and the Zadura region of Algeria, both of which are completely fictitious. Although, to be fair, if the American military-industrial complex had its way, I'm sure both actual countries would be fictitious as well. After all, what's a little regime change between friends? Anyway, some participants then read that an unbiased U.S. citizen <laughs> Oh wait, you serious? Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> had lived amongst the group for a year, and described the people of the Burham region as casual, candid, gregarious, lenient, obliging, congenial, modest, and pardoning, and that the people from the Zadura region, wait, was it Zura or Zadura? Which one did I transcribe wrong here? Oh well, they're fictional, so let's just go with the latter. By Azura, by Azura, by Azura, it's the grand champion. I can't believe it's you standing here next to me. <clears throat> Who were described as traditional, methodical, systematic, cultured, prudent, refined, pragmatic, and straightforward, all moderately positive traits, and everything that the French are not. They are a bunch of treacherous, lamb-burning, workshy peasants. <laughs> Other participants read that the American instead described the people of Burham as fussy, critical, complaining, dissatisfied, finicky, detached, withdrawn, and secretive. Wait, are we sure this is supposed to be a country and not a federal agency? And people from Zadura were described as brash, uncouth, boastful, ostentatious, tricky, showy, overconfident, and possessive all moderately negative traits. Afterwards, some subjects were asked to review the information they had previously read about the groups, while another was asked to generalize by coming up with eight additional traits people from that group possess. Not gangster blue-collar criminals like those SPINNAKERS! <laughs> Next, all respondents listed off one-word descriptions that came to mind when thinking about the Burham and Zadura people, positive or negative impressions of these traits and of the group in general, support for accepting group members into the US, willingness to socialize with them, or do business with them. The results were consistent across the board. Those who were asked to think about some other traits that these completely fictive groups might possess outside of those specifically stated had a more negative impression of that group and were less willing to admit them into the US, socialize with them, or do business with them. But most of all, I'm really sorry about your dirty, underhanded, backstabbing ways. Your number one dirty spinnaker fan, Mel Gibson. Being asked to extrapolate additional traits that apply to the group was related directly to having more extreme attitudes towards the group afterwards, both directly and indirectly as mediated through association extremity. That is, people who were asked to think more about a group of people, rather than reviewing what they already knew about them, reported more extreme words as being associated with that group. After that extrapolation process, and using more extreme words to describe a group produced more negative behavioral intentions such as being unwilling to socialize or do business with members of that group. Once again, neither of these groups exist, and thus within the course of just a few minutes, people were able to completely invent stereotypes about a fictional group of people, and they also became convinced that they wouldn't even want to interact with this non-extant group, all based on nothing more than mere thought. <laughs> 
In her second experiment, Decker turned her attention away from only asking participants to invent new traits possessed by a group of people based exclusively on their own imaginations, and instead was interested in how mere thought could influence perceptions of the likelihood that a previously foreign group would possess various traits that they had not been described as having. This experiment used the same fictional groups seeking to be recognized as a country by the US as the first study, and the extrapolated traits were drawn from prior responses from participants. For example, after reading that the Burham people were described by a US citizen who had lived amongst them as being fussy, participants would then rate the likelihood that the Burham were also selfish, or if the Zadura people were described as traditional, what the likelihood was that they were also organized. As with the first study in this dissertation, participants who had been asked to rate the likelihood that either group would have an additional trait that had not been explicitly stated by the American who lived with the Burham or Zadura had more negative impressions of the group and were less willing to admit them into the US, socialize with them, or do business with them. Additionally, those who extrapolated by rating the likelihood of possessing these novel traits was associated with greater attitude extremity, both directly and as mediated through association extremity. Just as in the first experiment, merely thinking about the traits that a group might possess, even if you have been given no evidence that that trait is present in a group of people, generates new extrapolated traits when ruminated upon. That is, if one hears something mildly negative or positive about a group of people, one is prone to invent completely baseless positive or negative traits that they also associate with that group. Thus, if one group is always described negatively by the media, say Trump supporters by the left-wing media or transgender activists by conservative media, well, then people who watch that media are going to create, via mere thought, new negative stereotypes about those groups. Finally, in her third experiment, Dr. Decker examined the importance of extrapolated trait relevance in comparison to extrapolated trait extremity, which when I reread that sentence sounds way more confusing than it actually is, so let me explain. Say you have just read that the Burham people are fussy, secretive, critical, withdrawn, complaining, detached, dissatisfied, and finicky, some more relevant and more similar but extreme words to extrapolate about the Durham then would be things like selfish, arrogant, loud, and rude, while relevant but less extreme words are things like cocky, coarse, bragging, and stubborn. While obviously some of these words are more intense, they still largely reflect the traits initially described. Low relevance and more extreme words to describe the Burham after reading that they possessed those traits are things like stupid, inefficient, and angry. And low relevance, less extreme traits are things like untidy, insecure, erratic, and disorganized. Nothing about the Americans' report of the Burham implied they were stupid or untidy. Thus, these descriptors are complete fabrications, while words like rude or coarse are far more relevant to a group of people who have been described as fussy and critical regardless of extremity. While the other components of this experiment were nearly identical to the previous studies, there were a few additional differences. Most notably that subjects were asked to what degree they believed that the US government should favor the Burham or Zadura people over people from other nations. Decker found unilaterally that subjects who expressed there was an increased likelihood that this fictional group of foreign people possessed a trait that was irrelevant to the provided descriptors, whether high or low in extremity, subsequently had significantly more negative attitudes towards that group, being less willing to admit them to the US, socialize with them or do business with them, and favor them over groups from other nations. In other words, when people invented new negative traits, whether they be extreme or mild, the result was the same decreased willingness to associate with the unfamiliar group. As with the previous two studies, the relevance and extremity of extrapolations were related both directly to attitude extremity and indirectly to attitude extremity as mediated through association extremity. Thus, while mere thought can certainly leave people with the impression a group of people possesses negative traits that they have no real reason to believe that that group actually possesses, this negativity, both in terms of impression and behavioral intent, is more common when the extrapolated associations are irrelevant to the actually available information. To take these findings out of the lab and into the real world a bit, it's been a common trope amongst the broader Democratic establishment for decades to say that Republicans are stupid. Our guest judge today is Special Combat Advisor for Capcom, Seth McFarlane. Republicans are stupid. Just watch any episode of The Daily Show or Colbert Rapport from the 2000s for a limitless list of examples. But while the feeling appears to be mutual, at least according to this 2018 Axios poll, 
an extrapolation from that belief is something like seeing Republicans as not only dumb, but also as anti-science, which was the rallying cry for three years of the COVID pandemic. They're not just stupid, they hate science. On the opposite side of the aisle, Republican pundits have been saying for years that left-wing organizations like BLM and calls for reparations are nothing more than grifts. It really should come as no surprise, then, that more than half of Republicans in that same Axios poll see Democrats as being spiteful. And I mean, that does kind of make sense when you look at the indictment of Donald Trump. It's all moot because the J in Donald J. Trump now stands for jail. That's all. Whatever you think about the validity of these interpretations, in line with the research that we've just looked at, we can see how mere thought, how memes even, can very much color our interpretation of a group of people's traits and attributes. If we can invent traits and come to dislike a group of people that don't even exist based on nothing more than words and a few moments of thought, it should be no surprise why real-world political parties and groups find themselves to be so deeply partisan. By nothing more magical than listening to words. Mere words. At some point, the truth ceases to matter and fabrication becomes the dominant motivator in determining actual behaviors, even behaviors as simple as wanting to socialize with or do business with another person who belongs to that group that we have often inadvertently generated false information about, and again, based on nothing more than our own imaginations. But hang on, because there's a heck of a lot more research from Dr. Decker, as she and Lord 2020 also conducted research examining how mere thought specifically thoughts generalizing traits of a group could produce extremist attitudes towards that group across a series of four experiments. In their first study, English-speaking U.S. citizens were told that two migrant caravans were headed towards the U.S. through Mexico. One of these caravans originated in the Salaban region of Guatemala and the other from the Montenegro region of Nicaragua. And I gotta be really careful saying those latter words for the YouTube algorithm. Some participants read that eight unbiased Americans who had lived in either region described the group as either being crafty and cunning or as being argumentative and critical in a specific context, either at a street fair or at a sports competition. Neither of these regions exist, and thus the participants could have no personal knowledge nor existing stereotypes regarding either the Saliban nor Montenegan people. After reading the descriptions, respondents were asked to generalize one of the two groups by ranking on a 10-point scale how likely the caravan members would be to engage in crafty or argumentative behaviors across eight different business or miscellaneous settings. For example, rating the likelihood that a Saliban migrant would get into an argument with a TSA agent at an airport over a pat-down. Very professional here, just standard procedure. I'm gonna have to grab, grab and squeeze that area. <laughs> Some participants were only asked to review information about the other migrant group rather than to generalize about them. Afterwards, subjects were asked for their positive or negative impressions of the two groups, their support or opposition to admitting the caravanners into the U.S., their desire to socialize with the migrants or to do business with them. The group that had been generalized via merely thinking about them was seen less favorably and respondents reported being less willing to admit them into the U.S., socialize with them or do business with them compared to the group that was merely reviewed. That is, when people were asked to think about how a group of people might behave based only on vaguely negative descriptions of that group's behavioral traits, despite having no personal experience with the group because they don't exist, those subjects came to believe the group was comprised of less desirable types of people, compared to when they just read those vaguely negative descriptors. Mere thought exacerbated negative perceptions based on scarce and ambiguous information. What the how dare you insult my grandmother! Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to come off rude. A second experiment utilized the same scenario as the first, describing two migrant caravans headed towards the U.S., but this time the descriptions provided by the American who had lived in the same region as either group were positive rather than negative. Specifically, eight descriptions of one group reported them as agreeable and obliging, while eight descriptions of the other group reported them as being innocent and generous, either in the streets or in a sports setting. Results were similar to the first study, but in the opposite valence, and were less consistent. In that participants who were asked to make behavioral generalizations about one of the groups with positive descriptors rated that group more favorably and were more willing to socialize with them. However, they were not more willing to admit them into the US, nor to do business with them compared to the group that they did not generalize, but merely reviewed. Both groups were viewed significantly more positively than the two groups from the first experiment. However, it seems that the power of mere thought on behavioral intentions is far less robust as it concerns positive traits rather than negative ones. 
That is when people ruminate on negative beliefs that they have about a group of people that they have no personal knowledge nor experience with, opinions towards that group will be unilaterally more negative and lead persistently to negative perceptions of anticipated behaviors related to that group. While in contrast, when people ruminate on the positive beliefs they have about a group, the positive beliefs are less influential on behavioral intentions regarding how to treat that group in the future. In other words, it seems this effect of mere thought really only works in one direction, and it's a negative one. Decker and Lord's third experiment examined the replicability of mere thought on attitude extremity across various settings using a slightly different prompt. This time, subjects read that several geopolitical regions across the world had, quote, petitioned the UN to be recognized as countries. Recognition carries with it many benefits, one of which is that a citizen of a recognized country can apply for immigration into the United States, which has a very high standard of living. We will be giving you information about a region that has asked the UN to recognize them as a country in their own right, New Caledonia. I'll be deep in the cold, cold ground before I recognize Missouri. Multiple conditions describe the people from New Caledonia as being crafty and cunning or critical and argumentative. And with examples of these behaviors being reported on either in the street, at a sporting event, or in a business context. Participants were asked how willing they would be to admit the New Caledonians into the US, favorability towards the New Caledonians, and desire to socialize or do business with them. Subjects were also asked how likely they believed it was for a New Caledonian to lie or cheat in an attempt to enter the US. After initially giving their impressions, some respondents were asked to generalize by predicting the likelihood a New Caledonian would display negative traits in different social contexts, and their attitudes were again measured. Finally, all subjects completed a memory test to see how well they remembered the initial context in which the Americans who had lived amongst them described their behaviors, be they crafty and cunning, or critical and argumentative. Before generalizing by thinking about the potential for the New Caledonians to behave unethically in public, impressions of them as a group were less negative than after the rumination. Thinking about the likelihood that a New Caledonian would engage in bad behavior also resulted in decreased favorability towards allowing them to enter the US, socialize with them, or do business with them. Once again, these data are illustrative that just thinking about a group of people that one does not know, based solely on vaguely negatively loaded information about that group, significantly reduces favorability and willingness to interact with that group in the future. Additionally, 32% of the time, participants incorrectly remembered the initial setting in which the New Caledonians had been described as behaving in a cunning or argumentative behavior, and applied those behaviors to a novel context, extrapolating that because the group had been described as behaving in such a way in one context, they likely would do so in other contexts as well. Oh, do it again. For instance, participants who were asked if New Caledonians would also act that way in a police station later falsely remembered the observed behavior having been reported in a police station. It had not. Their memories were altered by mere thought to further generalize a completely fictive group of people based on nothing more than hearing someone else say something somewhat negative about that group. Wait, wait a minute, hang on. Something's just come across my desk here. What do you mean New Caledonia is a real place? The French did this? Why do the French own New Scotland? That's like the Israelis renaming Tel Aviv to New Berlin or Russia renaming itself to Sark. Well then, maybe we need to reconsider the validity of the data I just described then. Although I'm pretty sure we can say with some certainty that the average American undergraduate college student is not familiar with many New Caledonians. Anyway, a final study in this set examined the role of biased attribution on these relationships. Moral attributions have been described in academic literature as a propensity to ascribe positive and negative aspects to a person as being due to his or her personality rather than the situation or environment in which some behavior occurs. As in the previous experiments, participants were given some vaguely negative information about two groups of migrants headed towards the US, once again using the legitimately fictional Salabans and Montenegans. And then some were asked to generalize by thinking about how a member of that group might act while others merely reviewed the information provided describing the groups as cunning or argumentative, either in a street or sport context. All participants' attitudes towards the group's morals were measured, including the likelihood a member of that group would lie and cheat to get into the US or would steal if allowed entry. Participants were asked to imagine that they witnessed a member of one of the target groups taking out their garbage when they noticed the approach of a garbage truck arriving ahead of schedule. 
The group member then placed all items in the trash bin instead of separating the trash and recyclables. Afterwards, participants were asked if they believed that the other group member did not separate their trash because they didn't really care about cooperating with the city's ordinances to protect the environment. And when I'm done sucking down those grease ball burgers, I'm gonna wipe my mouth with the American flag, and then I'm gonna toss the styrofoam containers right out the side, and there ain't a goddamn thing anybody can do about it. A dispositional attribution related to the individual's personality, or if they simply did it because the city had changed the pickup schedule without their knowledge a situational attribution not reliant on some personality flaw. In other words, was the assumption that a person from this foreign group, which was described as having some negative traits, powerful enough to override the specific information about the change in schedule that participants had been directly informed of? As with the previous experiments, participants who were asked to generalize by merely thinking about how a member of one of the groups of immigrants might act in the future had a worse impression of that group were less willing to admit them into the U.S., socialize with them, or do business with them compared to the participants who were not asked to generalize. However, there were some significant differences based on individual tendencies towards correspondence bias. That is, subjects who invented more negative attributes beyond the very specific ones provided by the American who had lived amongst them, again being cunning or arrogant, the more negative that subject's attitude was towards the migrants. Specifically, people low in correspondence bias, who only reported the negative traits of the Montenegans or Salibans as being those specifically stated by the American, tended to have far fewer negative attitudes towards them, whether or not they had been asked to generalize their behaviors. In contrast, those high in correspondence bias, who extrapolated additional traits from members of the groups, for example, expanding their description from just being arrogant to being rude or even cruel, those people were always more negative towards the group but specifically so when they had been asked to generalize. Interestingly, those who generalized did not unilaterally report the group as being less moral than those who simply reviewed the information about them. Those who read that the migrants were critical and argumentative, and then generalized their potential behaviors, actually rated the group as more moral than those who did not generalize. I struggled to understand this finding, but it may be, given that this study was conducted at a U.S. university, wherein students by far and large tend to lean left, even at Texas Christian University, where this was conducted, it may be that the term moral was seen as being related to moralizing and thereby had in and of itself a negative connotation of being related to religiosity of a foreign group. That is, it's possible the subjects in this study thought that the foreign groups who were critical and argumentative were also moral because they assumed some religious belief held by that group. That's just a hypothesis, though. Do you really think ISIS has the <laughs> balls, right? <laughs> to turn up in Belfast? In opposition, and more in line with what we might expect from the rest of these findings in this research, those who generalized rated the migrants as significantly less moral when they had been described as crafty and cunning, viewing them as more likely to lie, cheat, and steal. Thus, even slight differences in the type of mild negative descriptor, when ruminated upon, can change the outcome of invented perspectives. All of my folks hate all of your folks. It's American as apple pie. Overall, those who generalized the migrant group, rather than review them, did not report that the group would display negative traits in situations outside those described nor did they report that they had more information about that group than those who reviewed them. However, there was a correlation present in that the more participants thought the generalized group would engage in cunning or arrogant behaviors across various contexts compared to the reviewed group, the more participants also believed that he or she had more knowledge about the generalized group and the more negative their reported attitudes and behavioral intentions towards that group became. To reiterate, for people who were asked to generalize a group by thinking about how they might act in various situations, when those people concluded said group would consistently engage in negative behaviors, they also tended to believe that they were more knowledgeable in their perspective on that group, view them more negatively, grant them asylum, socialize with them, or even do business with them. All via mere thought. The real-world evidence for this effect is so prolific that it would be impossible for me to even begin to list specific examples. But the harrowing event that occurred in Nashville, Tennessee in late March of 2023 is certainly a powerful one. On one hand, you have people like Michael Knowles making statements calling for the end of transgenderism. If it is false, then for the good of society, and especially for the good of the poor people who have fallen prey to this confusion, 
Transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. The whole preposterous ideology. Which, while he may have been referring to it as a political movement or ideology rather than to transgender people, could so easily be interpreted that way as to inevitably leave people with the impression that was in fact what he was advocating in favor of, and thereby escalate the belief of many trans people, LGBT allies, and left-leaning people in aggregate to generalize via mere thought, becoming more likely to believe that all Christian conservatives, like Michael Knowles, would be willing to enact violence against trans people in various scenarios. Being accused of genocide did take me by surprise. That seemed extreme even for the fake news media. And subsequently not only view them more negatively, but, well, let's just say, maybe go a bit further in their behavioral intentions than just not being willing to socialize or do business with Christian conservatives. In an increasingly politically polarized world, it makes a lot of sense then that so much animus is being purely invented in the minds of partisans, and we can learn more about how these psychological tendencies produce polarization by looking to another piece of research from Decker, Lord, and Holland 2022 across three experiments. In their first study, US participants read a short paragraph supposedly drawn from a recent UN survey that described traits of the average citizen of Peru or the Republic of Mahrain, a fictional country. I should at this point mention that with the exception of New Caledonia, which is, again, apparently a real place, if over the course of this video these fake groups have sounded very much like real groups to you, for example, Mahrain sounding very close to Bahrain, and Montenegrin being nearly identical to Montenegrin, it's because that was on purpose. The scholars intentionally chose names for these groups that sounded very similar to real-world groups of people such as to create external validity without describing an actually extant group of people. It's easy to believe that Latveria is a real country because it sounds so similar to Latvia combined with Siberia, for example. Latveria, all men go pantsless! Meanwhile, if these scholars had called these countries something ridiculous like, I don't know, Wagadu or Wales, no one would believe those were real countries that they just simply weren't aware of. Back onto the subject matter, and to illustrate that point, the average Peruvian was described as spontaneous and self-centered, while the average Mahranian was described as having strong opinions on everything and caring about material goods. Some participants were then informed that the US government was considering letting the Mahranians move to the states and was interested in the opinions of citizens towards the proposal, while others were asked a control question about the weather in their part of the country. And both groups were asked to write a short message of 250 characters intended for social media to a friend to explain either the US government's proposal or the local weather, and why he or she should respond negatively if contacted by pollsters regarding either issue. Five minutes later, subjects were asked about their attitudes towards the Mahranians and the Peruvians, as well as how much they rated themselves as being fair and unbiased in their supposed social media post something that no one has ever been. If you put one of those 280 character junk heaps on my feed, I'll flip a coin to decide if I should block you. I will let God choose your fate. Those who posted to a friend about the Mahranians subsequently expressed more negative attitudes towards them as a group and towards the prospect of Mahranians moving to the US compared to those who posted about the local weather. Clearly, it wasn't Local 58. The manipulation had no effect on attitudes towards Peruvians. When you have a new group, not an established one, such as Peruvians then, we can see how this effect of spontaneous stereotype generation is mitigated. Interestingly, those who reported trying harder to remain unbiased ultimately presented with the most negative attitudes towards the fictional Mahranians, thereby people who see themselves as the least biased perhaps are the most likely to develop false perceptions of a group or a person from that group. Respondents' messages to a friend were read by interrators to detect if statements about the Mahranians were derived from this source verbatim, if similar but not identical traits were included as a form of spontaneous trait inference, if additional traits were present as a form of exaggeration, and if completely novel information was added to the description, a form of elaboration. For example, while the text described Mahranians as having strong opinions on everything, spontaneous trait inference might be to instead describe them as opinionated, 
An exaggeration might be to call them arrogant, and an elaboration might be to say that Mahranians experience an increased crime rate, something that was entirely lacking from the actual information. Participants generally didn't have much nice to say about the Mahranians. As the more exaggerations and elaborations participants wrote, the more negative their subsequent attitudes towards Mahranians were. As such, when people were told negative information about a group of people they knew nothing about, those people tended to view that group negatively and even invented new negative information about the group when telling a friend about a political issue concerning them. Dear Joe, we voted, but you still ain't calling. We burned Kenosha and AutoZone at a precinct down in Portland and found 200,000 votes in autumn at 4 in the morning. There probably was a prom at the post office or something. The researchers were themselves concerned that participants may have believed their friend already had a strong negative opinion on the Mahranians, and as such, tailored their messages on social media in anticipation of how they expected their friend to feel. Thus, in a second experiment, subjects were told to write social media messages about the Mahranians for a person who had no knowledge of them and had responded to an opinion poll as being wholly undecided as to the proposal to allow them into the United States. This time, participants were told that there was a caravan of people from the fictive nation making their way through Mexico and would soon arrive in the US. The descriptions of Mahranians came from supposed self-reports rather than from an American working with the UN, and subjects were asked to write a message to an unbiased person either about the Mahranian caravan or about an unrelated topic. In this case, lowering the age to purchase tobacco products. Smoke one of my cigarettes. Put one of those in your mouth. Just suck on this like a lollipop. That looks amazing! Participants' attitudes towards the Mahranians were assessed, including their perceived desirable traits, if they should be able to enter the US, and if they would like to socialize or do business with them. Across all four measures, participants who wrote about the migrant caravans expressed more negative attitudes towards the Mahranians than those who wrote about tobacco. Subjects also reported that they believed their message would persuade the unbiased reader and specifically influence them to have a more negative attitude towards the Mahranian caravan as well. The messages included 31 verbatim statements, 7 spontaneous trait inferences, 77 exaggerations, and 109 elaborations. I don't like where this is going. But the results illustrate that fabrication was by far the most commonplace practice, and further, the more exaggerations and elaborations, the more negative attitudes participants reported having after writing the message. Once again then, when people were given some mildly negative information about a group of people they knew nothing about, they not only tended to come to view that group very negatively, they were also willing to lie and exaggerate to convince a neutral stranger that the group possessed these negative attributes, the very act of which only enforced and encouraged their own negative perspective. Well, if that isn't all of political Twitter, I don't really know what is. L them no cell, no bitches, fatherless, lame fits, fake J's, ratio, cumbrain! Another piece of research that we can examine on this subject, which came out of the same research program being conducted by Decker and her colleagues at Texas Christian University in the early 2020s, comes from Carlos Brayboler, published in 2022, concerning mere thought and polarization on social issues, specifically abortion. University students were first asked how positive or negative it was for a group of people to possess various traits, specifically being tolerant, peaceful, rude, ethical, unfriendly, dishonest, moral, uncooperative, trustworthy, kind, belligerent, courteous, unethical, mean, honest, intolerant, friendly, immoral, cooperative, and untrustworthy, as well as their personal opinion on abortion. Participants were then asked to describe five interpersonal traits of those who made frequent social media posts that either supported or opposed abortion. Did somebody just say abortion? <sighs> Laverne, with all due respect, this is none of your business. Or Jesus's. Subjects were then asked about their impressions and behavioral intentions towards these people, including how willing they would be to socialize with, do business with, and have their children, if they had any children, taught by such people. The report is just inflammatory now. What? They were too stupid to invent guns. Then why had they? Because some cultures find different things important. As we might expect, and yeah, this is one of those big no-the findings of social science, things that any drunk at a local pub could tell you. By the powers invested in me by a bloke I met in the pub who knew for definite I find your sort guilty of pedophilia. Respondents had more favorable impressions towards those who agreed with their own personal position on abortion. 
Similarly, students were more willing to socialize with, do business with, and have their children taught by those who shared their opinion on abortion. Finally, respondents reported that people who held the opposite political opinion that he or she did regarding abortion were possessed of more negative traits than those who aligned with their own position. Once again, we see that mere thought has the power to create completely imaginary traits associated with fictional, or in this case, hypothetical people when those people have done nothing more than disagree on a single political issue. It's not just that people will dislike others who disagree with them politically. They will invent, out of the ether, completely fictitious personal attributes for a random human being simply based on his or her stance on a particular political subject. Oh, I'm so sorry. I thought you were a successful Republican strategist. I'm so sorry. Why? Because I'm black? Oh. If political positions can motivate mere thought to alter perceptions of others, it probably should come as little surprise that so too can sex appeal, as seen in a series of studies from Brady and Lord 2013, who were interested in how some people might be capable of fooling themselves to the point of altering their own memories for the purpose of, well, getting some. College senior participants were given a survey at the beginning of a semester which included questions about their passion for various issues on campus, including a proposal to institute mandatory comprehensive exams as a prerequisite for graduating students, which they were very much not in favor of supporting, as we discussed earlier. Two weeks later, students completed what they believed was an unrelated study about online dating and were shown a curated dating profile of another student of the opposite sex who they were told they would meet later in the study. Why would you want to look like Sherlock Holmes? Who are you trying to attract exactly? Intelligent women. This profile used an image of the same person, either made to appear more attractive or as less attractive. Because the scholars were not clear about how they achieved this effect, although it was confirmed by interrater testing, feel free to use your own imagination. Now you're ready for a night on the town. <gasps> Homer, you've got it set on whore. Uh, oop. In addition to the photo, the profile included information about various issues the student was concerned with, including being very favorable towards instituting comprehensive exit exams. Subjects were asked how attractive the profile was, how much he or she would want to get along with this fellow student and make a good impression on them. Respondents then once again gave their own opinions towards comprehensive senior exams as well as took a memory test which asked participants to recall their opinions towards the exams two weeks prior. Yeah, this is basically just a simping test to illustrate how easy it is to alter memories and opinions. And, well, just seeing a dating profile of someone the student fancies seemingly had the power to change their opinions towards such a potentially annoying topic as being forced to take a massive test to finish their college education as not only were students more favorable towards such tests when they saw an attractive person who was also more favorable towards the test, but they actually altered their own memories to report that they had always been favorable towards the proposal. This relationship was only present as mediated through attractiveness through present responses, meaning that simply finding the person attractive did not alter memories alone. However, when the student found their cohort attractive, and then also changed their opinions, then their perception of the past changed as well. In short, simply learning that someone you find cute has a socio-political opinion that you've previously been opposed to can change one's current opinion and in doing so, also change one's perceptions of their past opinions on the subject. However, these results are just correlational, and thus a second study was designed to take an experimental approach. This time, college students were given a survey which assessed their favorability towards requiring comprehensive exams for graduation. Three weeks later, participants completed what they believed to be an unrelated survey. Some were given a profile of another supposed student who they were told they would be working with later in the experiment immediately before completing their own dating profile, while others completed their profile first before seeing the other student, who was, as in the first study, either attractive or unattractive. Part of these profiles included support for the comprehensive exams and subjects were asked to tell their supposed partner how he or she had responded to the question of exams on the first test three weeks prior. Finally, participants completed a memory test and were asked to recall their exact response for the earlier opinion questionnaire for the researchers rather than for the other student, including how confident they were in the accuracy of their memories. When students had no knowledge of the opinions of their fellow student, not receiving information about that person's opinion on the subject matter until after creating their own profile they generally recalled having a negative response to the proposal. 
seeing an attractive student actually produced even more recall of negative prior opinions before being informed that that attractive student was more supportive of the idea. Participants were slightly more positive towards the proposal when the other student was unattractive, perhaps because subjects believed that the person they found physically attractive would obviously have similar opinions to him or herself as a function of the halo effect. That is, we tend to believe that beautiful people are also smart, and thus would of course agree that requiring students of all majors to pass a standardized test to graduate after four years of specialization into a specific field isn't that great of an idea, but also that we tend to see ourselves as smart and expect people that we like to be smart as well. Is that your name, or are you telling me you're finished talking? Both. Done and done. <laughs> <laughs> I like Ron. In contrast, when participants knew the opinion of the other student before creating their own profile, they were more amicable towards instituting exams when that student was also attractive compared to when they were unattractive, in which case negative opinions towards exams persisted. Men and women both united in their inequity for simping. I would say anything to get what I want and I, I want you to like me. So. Uh... As with the first experiment, there was no direct effect of partner attractiveness and foreknowledge of his or her response to the topic of exams on false memories. However, there was when it was mediated through present responses. That is, once again, when participants changed their opinion in the present in response to seeing an attractive person who held that opinion, only then did they inaccurately recall their previously held beliefs. These results illustrate that people may spontaneously lie about past evaluative actions to make favorable impressions on an attractive opposite sex person, and the very act of lying can alter their memory of their past action. As such, it's possible for something as superficial as physical appearance to not only change one's mind regarding a social issue that would affect many other people, but for such a phenomenon to even influence memory. You are not immune to propaganda. And you never will be. While certainly activists don't always tend to be the most physically attractive human beings, when it comes to hot button topics like trans issues, certainly one side has more social capital than the other, so much so that as to even suggest that maybe, just maybe, we should cool the jets on providing pseudo pornographic materials in public schools, giving children hormone blockers, at which point they are very unlikely to desist and not move on to cross sex hormones and surgeries is often met not just with rage, but claims of genocide. Bans from social media to even be able to openly express such an opinion in the public square, and now outright physical violence. While, again, this is not physical attraction, it is a position of social capital, an attraction to a position of social and moral status. And thus, in its own way, very attractive to the point where many people may change their opinions to impress others and even falsely recall having always held that new opinion. And with all of that in mind, let's come to a few conclusions. Over the course of this video, we've seen how people are able to essentially gaslight themselves into beliefs and opinions completely by the power of mere thought while the media can certainly promote what topics are important, in isolate no amount of news articles nor journalistic coverage of a story can influence what any given person will think about that story. However, the media can lead the public to believe that a story is important. The more important that people think some issue or subject is, the more they tend to think about it. And the more they think about it, the more convinced they will become of their opinions, turning ambivalence into dogmatism. The effect of self-persuasion is so powerful that over the course of just a few minutes of mere thought, people can not only accept stereotypes about a group that they had no prior knowledge of are true, but create new stereotypes for that group and beliefs about how people from that group will behave. In our 24-7 news cycle, constantly connected society, where it is virtually impossible to escape news and politics when we're all walking around with the entire repository of human knowledge and opinions resting in our pockets, it should then be no surprise that partisanship has reached its current fever pitch. Social and traditional media tell us what's important, and the power of mere thought, of rumination, turns that perceived importance into obsession and fanaticism. In most cases, this results in little more than people just yelling past each other, 
completely unable to understand why the same important issue is being interpreted differently when both positions may have been reached by this mere thought effect. But in some cases, it can truly turn dark, whether it be the many Americans who protested at Jan 6 because they truly believed that Donald Trump had won the 2020 US election, those who continued to be terrified of COVID long after most of the rest of the world has moved on, to people who have heard over and over again that transgender people are facing a genocide and decide to take the law into their own hands by turning the tables, as it were, and taking the lives of children. It is not the media in and of itself that has caused this effect, although I would say the media certainly does bear some responsibility. It's actually the power of mere thought that creates the monsters of our imagination. But hey, what do you guys think? Do you think the media is more to blame for increasing partisanship, even if it is mediated through mere thought? How can we turn down the heat of political animus when we all have perpetual access to the never-ending news cycle? Have you ever personally experienced self-generated memories or self-persuasion, falsely remembering or stereotyping members of a group based on nothing more than just thinking about them? I'll be the first to mea culpa there. I certainly know that I have done that when it comes to politics, and it seems that it's actually quite normal. Hence, perhaps, the problem. But let me know what you guys think in the comments down below, because I actually am interested, but also because it really helps me out in the algorithm. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe if you're not already subscribed for more long-form social science content. If you really liked the video and want to support my work, you can do so by leaving a super thanks, sign up for my Patreon or Subscribestar to see your name at the end of every video like these fine folks here, buying some merch from my merch store, or by checking out my sponsor. If for some reason you want to hear me talk even more, I do a weekly news and politics podcast, Broken Crown, with my co-host Spoon, every Wednesday at 3.30pm Eastern, 8.30pm UK. I also play a Pathfinder tabletop role-playing game on that same channel every Tuesday at 4pm Eastern, 9pm UK, with fellow content creators Kami Mark and single player Carl. Thank you so much for watching this video, and as always, dear friends, all ton of volts. Don't leave.